For thousands of years, two distinct cultures evolved unaware of one another's existence. Separated by what one culture called the Great Sea, and known to the other as the Atlantic Ocean, the course of each culture's future changed irreversibly when they encountered one another along the shores of what is known today as Cape Cod. This is the story of what drove the English across the ocean and how the Poconoket people responded to them. Montauk, Rhode Island, 1580. The time for Magnus to deliver would arrive soon. Last spring, her brother's woman, Sokanon, went alone to the birthing place he built for her. A couple of days later, Sokanon returned with her sleepy new infant wrapped in fur. Though this was not her first baby, she felt more secure once her sister, Tatapanunum, and sister-in-law, Sokanon, agreed to accompany her to her birthing place. Men built the birthing places far from the village Witus, but even so, sometimes birthing cries reached the village. Magnus thought, it is good to have others with me. Far into the night, the women talked. Every few minutes, Magnus felt her baby stretch and push against her swollen belly, then be still again while the women resumed telling their stories. The black night sky slowly yielded to the gray of pre-dawn, then pastel peach, and finally bright orange. The baby stirred more often now. Whenever another sharp pain ripped across Magnus's lower back, she grabbed the birthing strap hung over a sturdy pole supporting the birthing structure. She gritted her teeth until the pain relented. Each pain began like a low wave gently washing to shore, increasing in intensity until it became a crescendo of agony. As the pains began to come on top of one another, she tightened her grip on the birthing strap and squatted, waiting with hope and pain co-mingled together. Each time another contraction rolled across her lower abdomen, Tatapanunum gently rubbed Magnus's shoulders and sang a soothing melody. Sokanon wiped the sweat off her brow and kept reminding her, Breathe in. Push the breath out. Long. Slow. In. Out. Slow. There. Good. Good. Tatapanunum rubbed her back and crooned. Soon, sweet sister, soon. She repeated this over and over as Magnus pulled on the strap and pushed with all her strength. She cried out again, and this time Tatapanunum clapped with delight. I see the top of the head, I see the head. Sokanon reminded her, take in a deep breath now and push. Magnus clenched her teeth and panted. I see the head, exclaimed Tatapanunum. A head of thick, silky hair. A moment later, the baby slipped from her body onto a soft, woven cattail mat beneath her. The infant, covered with milky residue from his mother's birth canal, landed with a soft thud on the mat. He pumped his tiny arms and legs and looked around. Tatapanunum swooped him up, still attached to the umbilical cord, and gently tapped him on the back. He sputtered and spit out what was in his mouth, then cried in protest at being suddenly exposed to the cold. Magnus delivered the placenta, let go of the birthing strap, and sank down onto a fur blanket. She reached for her son and clutched him to her bosom. With her free hand, she gently touched each tiny finger and toe. Sokanon handed a knife to Magnus after she lay the baby across her outstretched legs so she could cut him free from the placenta. Sokanon picked it up and gently set it aside. Exhausted from labor, Magnus leaned against the center pole. With tears of gratitude, relief, and joy washing her cheeks, she watched Tatapanunum clean her baby and place him in the birth sack. A few weeks earlier, sensing the time to deliver was near, she'd sewn a beaver pelt into the sack, with the soft fur turned to the inside. The baby filled his tiny lungs and let out an ear-piercing cry. All three women laughed with relief that he was alive and healthy. Magnus held out her arms to receive the baby. Elated at the sound of his cry, she snuggled him in her arms, gently pressed his mouth against one swollen breast, and nudged him to take his first suck of milk. As the baby nursed, Sokanon buried the placenta in the earth as a gesture of gratitude for this gift of new life. Then she left to inform Wimika his wife Magnus had safely delivered his son. So it was that Massasoit Osamiquin made his entry into the Poconoket community. He and his brother Quataquina grew up together in strength and stature during the time when disturbing changes disrupted their ancient ways. The English would eventually think of these brothers as the two kings.
the mid-Atlantic Ocean, 1620. The howling wind grew even more intense, making it impossible to hear Master Jones yell out orders to the crew. Jones waved his arms in a wild arc, motioning everyone to get below. William and Mary Brewster rushed down into a hold full of women and children screaming or crying. Men shouted all at once. No one could decipher who said what. Two sailors tossed coils of ropes into the crowd. Tie yourselves down. It's going to get worse. Nothing we could do but ride it out. Go on now. Do it quick before someone breaks a bone. The wind whipped waves up over the ship's railing, pouring icy salt water into the lower decks. Dark replaced what little light they'd had at the start of the storm. William huddled with Mary and the children. He prayed, Lord, deliver us. Let us not have forsaken all to be buried alive in this watery grave that surrounds us. He and Mary held fast to their children as icy seawater drenched everyone and everything. Anything not tied down was rolling back and forth, bruising anyone in the way. Then, their precarious situation got worse. <laughs>